Welcome back to another episode of Space This Week. Lots to cover once again. The skyline is about to change at Starbase as the high base demolition begins and construction of the Giga Bay prepares to start in its wake. Butch and Sunny finally returns to Earth after nine months in space. Falcon 9 smashed its launch turnaround window and flew twice over the past week. Rocket Lab made another outing with their Electron, China launched two Ceres missions and completed another spacewalk on their station, and ISAR Aerospace are getting ready to make their first orbital launch attempt from Europe with their Spectrum rocket. All of this and so much more, so I hope you enjoy. Down at Starbase, Starship Gazer captured this beautifully tragic footage of the start of demolition works to the high bay. Rendered somewhat obsolete by the much more versatile mega bays, and taking up very valuable real estate at the very busy Starbase site. So far, the roof is slash has been dismantled, depending on when you watch this video, and the rest of the building will quickly follow. Remember how quickly the mid bay came crashing down when its days came to an end? While I'm not overly sentimental over the loss of the high bay, because I mean, why would I be? It's a shame we never really got to see the bar open to the public. That's what was present on the top floor of the high bay. And with those big glass windows, you'd have had panoramic views of the whole Starbase site. That's not to say it was never used. There were a couple of times we saw a party up there, such as in this footage from Daz at NASA Space Flight, taken back in the summer of 2021, probably in celebration of Elon's 50th birthday. While there isn't really very much footage or photos from the top of the high bay, we do have this view taken from the top of one of the mega bays, which arguably have better views anyway, considering that the, um, air quotes, bar area thing is double height. So maybe there's still hope that one day you and I can watch a Starship launch while sipping martinis in a mega bay bar. <laughs> What's going to replace the high bay? Not a mega bay, but an even larger giga bay. Here's SpaceX's official render of how the one planned to be built in Florida will look, and it's safe to assume that the one at Boca Chica will probably follow a similar, if not identical, design. 3D Daniel created some amazing looking mock ups of how it might eventually turn out. But yeah, goodbye high bay. Hopefully Zach got all his camera stuff out of there in time. <laughs> SpaceX made sure to remove Booster 15 from inside, and it's now been relocated to the Rocket Garden, undergoing further post-flight inspections. Whether or not SpaceX will attempt to refly it remains to be seen. Meanwhile, Booster 16, having completed its initial test campaign at Massey's, was transported back to the production site. The high bay wasn't the only thing undergoing destruction last week. NASA Spaceflight's McGregor Live captured the moment of a Raptor 2 going boom on the test stand, though this likely wasn't a rud, rather an intentional test to destruction, possibly in relation to Starship Flights 7 and 8, the latter of which we know suffered catastrophic failure of multiple Raptor engines, seen here with a sea level and vacuum Raptor completely absent during Ship 34's final moments. While some things at Starbase are being torn down, others are being built up. Progress with Pad B's launch pad and flame trench are progressing well. Starship Gazer captured the arrival of several hefty metal flame trench wall segments. These will be positioned and welded together over what will likely take a few weeks, even at Starbase speeds, before the big gaps between the metal walls are filled with concrete. Concrete pouring has been ongoing on the flame trench foundations already. We've seen around 300 truckloads so far, and even that number is on the very low end of how much will eventually need to be poured. In addition to the massive steel walls, we also saw the arrival of lots of piping to supply the pad's water deluge system. All of this is in service to a launch pad that will hopefully be more resilient to the power of a super heavy launch than pad A, which is still covered in scaffolding and being tended to by crews weeks after the last flight. Is this all just inspections and tests, or are things actively needing to be repaired or refurbished? Let me know what you think in the comments below. It wasn't just groundworks going down at Pad B last week. For the first time ever, the launch and catch tower's arms were raised to full height. They're distinguishable from the arms of Pad A's tower by the fact that they're a little bit stubbier. The launch area as a whole also saw the arrival of this thing. An entire building arrived on the back of a truck, having presumably been prefabricated in some factory somewhere and transported in one go. Presumably this was easier and more cost effective than just building it on site. 
This is apparently an electric power switching bunker, also known as a motor control center. Maybe this is something you can just buy, hence why SpaceX didn't need a full custom job. These things are used in a lot of industries, like in chemical plants, and their purpose is to control and protect electric motors used for power distribution, something likely required by the ongoing massive expansion works at the launch site. Astronomer Andrew McCarthy shared this incredible photo on Twitter last week. Amazingly, this was taken from a telescope in his backyard, which he modified to view the sun's atmosphere. I'm sure you can see that massive arc of plasma being ejected. It's hard to get a sense of scale because of how incomprehensibly big the sun is, but that arc is bigger than Jupiter, and Andrew followed up with a little Photoshop showing how multiple Earths can fit inside that arc. Scary stuff. If you're not following Andrew on Twitter, by the way, definitely do so. He posts some absolutely amazing things. I was rather hoping I'd be able to talk about Europe's first non-Russian orbital launch attempt today, as today was the day that ISAR Aerospace were hoping to launch. They're a German startup developing the two-stage Spectrum rocket, which will launch from the Andoya Space Center, located on Andoya Island, located in very northern Norway, a location that's prone to some very lovely views of the northern lights. The launch was sadly scrubbed due to unfavorable winds, but the vehicle and pad remain in good condition, so hopefully the next launch attempt won't be too far away. Spectrum is powered by nine Aquila engines in its first stage and one in its upper stage, and will be able to carry 1,000 kilograms to low Earth orbit, almost the same as Firefly Alpha, and roughly three times the payload mass capacity of Rocket Lab's Electron, to give you a comparison. Its maiden flight will carry no payload though, as it's a pure flight test only. ISAR have confirmed that they are already in the process of assembling the second and third Spectrums as we speak. What did launch last week was a Falcon 9. No surprise there at all, actually. It launched twice, in fact, launching both 23 Starlink satellites to space on the 18th of March and 11 Star Shield satellites to space on the 21st. Star Shield is the military version of Starlink, and what was notable about this particular flight was that it set a new record for a booster turnaround. The Falcon 9 first stage on this mission was B-1088, on a turnaround of just nine days since its last launch, which is absolutely insane. Tuesday saw a launch from New Zealand's Mahia Peninsula. This was, of course, a Rocket Lab Electron, and on board was the next batch of five Kinase nanosatellites. This mission was dubbed High Five because it carried five satellites and was the fifth of five planned launches for the Kinase satellite constellation, which is an Internet of Things constellation, or just IoT. The launch was successful and concluded Rocket Lab's launch contract with Kinase, for now at least. China's Ceres-1 made two outings over the week as well. On Monday, it carried two Earth observation satellites to low Earth orbit, in addition to a meteorological research payload, and on Friday, it launched carrying just the one meteorology satellite. After nine months and two weeks, Butch and Sunny finally returned to Earth from their planned eight-day test flight mission of Boeing Starliner. As we know, the spacecraft suffered multiple failures that left NASA deeming it unsafe to return its crew, and as such, Butch and Sunny were moved to fill in the role of two members of the Crew-9 mission, which in turn had two of its assigned astronauts moved to a future mission. Because of the fact that they launched and returned in two different vehicles, Butch and Sunny both hold the title of having flown in space in four different vehicles. The Space Shuttle, Soyuz, Boeing Starliner, and now SpaceX Dragon. This is a really rare achievement to have. Only one other person has done it, the late John Young, who flew in Gemini, the Apollo Command Module, the Apollo Lunar Lander, and the Space Shuttle. And there's a potential argument to be made there that the Apollo Lunar Lander and the Command Module weren't entirely distinct, but that's not really for me to decide. <laughs> anyway, Splashdown occurred on the 18th of March, and egress was successful. I'm sure Butch and Sunny are very happy to have two feet on the ground after nine long months in space. Meanwhile, on China's space station, the current crew conducted the third spacewalk, completed on the 21st of March. The spacewalk lasted around seven hours and was conducted by Taikonaut Tsai Xuzia and Song Lingdong, and they achieved a number of things, including installation of space debris protection devices and EVA auxiliary facilities, as well as inspect the current EVA equipment. They were assisted by crewmate Wang Haozu, who operated the station's robotic arm from inside the Tianhe core module. Laon Aerospace conducted a single stage to orbit passenger spaceplane mission last week, flying what I felt was a rather pretty SSTO to the minty flats of Minmus. It was a smaller scale mission compared to what I usually do, as I was recovering from the flu last week, but you know, I still think it was a fun mission and the video turned out great, so if you want to watch it, then click that card on screen. And if you want to help support what I do here, then you can click the links below to join my Patreon or YouTube member programs, just like the amazing people on the right did. But that's the end of today's episode of Space This Week. I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll catch you next time.